Praise the Lord. So good to see you. And let us all stand together. Please, Stephanie, if you would ask the Lord to bless our service. Please. Lord, we praise and thank you for this opportunity to come to your house. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to always be singing to you and witnessing to others. In my name I pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're starting with 175. Look to the Lamb of God. 175.
to make a difference, to go a little bit deeper, grow a little bit more for your honor and for your glory. So bless, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, linking to this idea of um, missionary and recognizing that our greatest testimony is our lifestyle. Our greatest testimony is really your behavior, the things you do, the things you say, the way you act, in particular, when you don't think anybody's watching. Because that is the real you. That's you without any sort of pretense, uh, without any sort of caution. It is you in the flesh, so to speak. And that you that people might see when you don't think they are watching needs to always be a reflection of Christ and always should be reflecting um, what the Lord has done for us and the lifestyle, the attitudes that God would like to see, asks to see, I'll go even further, demands to see within his children. And I want to touch on one of those uh, this evening. One characteristic that is absolutely one that God wants to see within all of us. And then something that is best displayed by God himself. And see how the two are connected. So as recently as today, you might be surprised to hear this, I made a mistake. Yes, even I make mistakes, multiple by the way. But uh, today I was informed uh, through a phone call uh, of a mistake, a rather grand mistake. I'm not going to tell you what it was, that's not important. Um, but it would have been, I have to say, my first, perhaps my first instinct was to not only apologize, but very quickly come up with some excuse. In my mind, I think it might even be somewhat legitimate, honest. I wasn't thinking about lying. But it would have been so much easier to say to this person that I was talking to, not only that I was very sorry, but that it wasn't my fault. Or that it was because, and then give some reason. I didn't end up doing that. I actually said to this individual that likely there wasn't anything really grandiose or in particular that I could say that would make my error better or would make it go away. There was no way to make it go away. It had been done. So I apologized and later further apologized through written format over an oversight on my part. Not purposeful, but a mistake. These errors that we make happen to everybody. They happen frequently, as a matter of fact, probably more often than we want to confess that they happen. But this evening I want to focus, just for a few moments, on how important it is for God's people to be examples in taking responsibility for our decisions, for our actions. Some of which, most of which, we pray will be correct. You see, it's easy for us, it's, nobody is going to hesitate, I'm quite sure, to take responsibility for the decisions that you make, the choices that you make, the actions that you take part in that are good ones, that are correct. And we thank and praise the Lord. I hope you can join me in thanking and praising God for the many, many, many times, even today, where you have made a good choice, you have made good decisions, and it's easy to take responsibility in a sense for those. Now, as I say that, we also must recognize as God's children that all that we do really comes from the Lord in that sense, particularly the good things. We do make those mistakes, though, and for those things we also need 
to learn, as the Bible tells us, and we're going to take a look at in a moment, to, we must learn and be honest to take responsibility for the decisions and choices we make that are incorrect. The things that were not right. Even if we thought they were, but the result, the consequence, wasn't a positive one. And therefore, we, for those things, also need to learn to take responsibility. Before this example came to take uh, place this, this morning in my own life, I was particularly thinking about the people down in Louisiana and in the Mississippi area with regards to the hurricane. And, and again, because as God's people, we also need to be examples of honesty. And so I choose to use myself as an example of that and at times share with you where I have been wrong. I've been angry with some of the people down in Louisiana who refused to evacuate. And I actually found myself watching some of the news reports and thinking, why are they making such a big deal about these people that are in this mess, after all, because they refused to do what they were advised to do. And I thought, you're, you're highlighting people who made bad choices. You're highlighting people who you know, didn't leave, and now they were trapped, and then they had all these stories about, oh, how terrible it was that I had to spend the whole night on my kitchen island. Maybe you heard that story, you know, this lady who the water was rising, and so she was, you know, sleepless night on her kitchen island as she watched the waters rise, and she thought, was worried whether she was going to, you know, be flooded out or not. I confess, part of me said, well, too bad, that's your own fault. Since then, God led me to an interesting message that both speaks about the responsibility for our actions. So I'm not going to completely um, say that those people were not at fault. I personally think that they were. It's their choice. They had a choice, and that's fine. But I guess what I'm saying is that what I see in Scripture is that when you make a choice, the consequence that comes with that choice is yours to bear. It's not really fair for you to expect, and listen to my words very carefully, not really fair for you to expect somebody else to bail you out. Somebody else to necessarily pay the price for you. You see, as God's people, we can't expect that, we can't anticipate necessarily that that's going to happen. So these people that, and I'll go back to the hurricane example, that found themselves in a difficult situation, I would say for the most part, I understand there might have been some that could not get out, could not evacuate, and for whatever reason chose not to. But you see, when you choose not to do what the warning tells you you should do, for whatever reason, either you think the warning is a lie, or you don't think it's going to be as bad, the reason doesn't matter. You have to be prepared for the consequence. And it isn't really fair, again, in my opinion, to expect other people to put their lives at risk to come and rescue you. Now, they may choose to do that, but it's not really fair for anybody, I think, to expect that to happen. And one of the difficulties I think I see in society today is we have a lot of people that love to do things, but really hate to take responsibility. And so they'll push it off. And they'll say, well, uh, that was not my fault, it was that person who was supposed to do that. And then that person said, no, no, it was that person that was supposed to do that. And, and it goes down the line, so to speak, until it just about disappears. And then in the end, you can't find anybody 
who's responsible. And that sort of mentality, that attitude, is not a Christian attitude. Is not a biblical attitude. And so I say, as missionaries, which I'm looking at you, and I believe that we all have to get more of a mindset, or maybe it's just me, but more of a mindset to think of yourself every day, regardless of where you go as a missionary. You might not be carrying a sign, so to speak. It might do us good, actually. You know, if you, had to, if you were carrying a sign that said, I'm a Christian! Maybe we'd all be a little more careful about the message, the example, the way we responded to things. But we have to keep that in mind. I'm thinking about grandchildren going back to school. You might have grandchildren or you know of children going back to school. They have to be missionaries. If you are going to be a Christian example, you have to be a missionary. And really, one of the things I probably miss, or I miss having the opportunity to do, was when I was in the workplace, and when you were, or if you still are in the workplace, every time you come in contact with another person who doesn't know you, you're a missionary, in particular. So as a principal, when I had new staff members, every new staff member, every new family, that came into my school, every new child that came into my school was a mission field. And I had an opportunity to, by example, by word, to let people know what it meant to be a Christian, to serve Him. So, responsibility, that's the first half, first part of what I want to take a look at this evening. That's a bit of a long introduction. Galatians 6 and 5. We'll start with this one verse. It's not a very long verse. But it tells us something about responsibility. Galatians 6 verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now, the easiest way to think about this, or the first way, at least for me, I thought about, let's think for a second. Let's all imagine that we're going on a trip together. All of us. Let's even pretend we're flying somewhere. If I had my way, we'd fly somewhere nice and warm, where there's sand and blue water. And uh, so you can imagine wherever you want to go. But we're going on a trip. The important thing is, though, that I tell you that although we're going to go for two weeks, what you pack, you carry. I'm not going to help you get it on into the bus. I'm not going to help you get it out of the bus. I'm not going to help you carry it into the plane or get it close to the plane. I'm not going to help you get it out of the plane. When we get to the hotel, you take it to your room, not me. And if we have to walk for blocks and blocks and blocks, you're carrying your suitcase, you're carrying your luggage, not me. You see, to me, that's a really simple way of thinking about responsibility. You pack it, you carry it. Okay? It's not fair for you to think that somebody else is going to necessarily do it for you. Okay? And so when Scripture tells us, for every man shall bear his own burden, if I were to modernize it in a simple sense, you're going to carry your own suitcase. Your luggage. Or, more importantly, if we think about it spiritually, your burdens, your cares, your anxieties, all of these things are yours to carry. Now, if I knew that there was going to be a lot of hiking involved in the trip that we're going to take, I think I would be wise to do my very, very best to pack as little a suitcase or knapsack 
as I possibly could. Knowing that nobody else is going to carry it, I'm responsible for it myself. I'm not going to pack one of those, you know, big, you know, four foot by whatever, you know, suitcases that the only way you can move it is on the wheels because we might be going on a jungle hike. The road may not always be that smooth. And so I'm going to want to minimize what I am carrying. Spiritually, that means that my cares, my worries, my burdens, all of those kind of things, I'm not going to want to hold on to those things. I'm going to want to let them go. And here comes the blessing. While we can't expect, because, you know, we're so important, we can't expect that God will carry the heavy end of the load. We're blessed by the mercy that he shows us, that tells us he will carry the heavy end of the load. The second part of the title is mercy. Responsibility and mercy. Let's go back to the hurricane example. After I thought about those individuals, I confess to you, I thought, I'm not thinking in a very nice Christian way. Imagine if I was one of those people. Yes, I made a bad choice. But now I'm in trouble. Wouldn't I want somebody to come and help me? Wouldn't I want somebody to rescue me? And I have to be honest, I have to say, yes, I would. I would. I'd be very thankful. And I'd be very sorry and want to make restitution for my poor choice, my poor decision that I had made. That in the end, even cause some people to perhaps put their own lives in danger because of my poor decision. Can you see the Christian overlap? Can you understand that Jesus is the rescuer? That we make bad choices and the Lord says that he can save us but we can't expect it. And I hope you understand that, right? I don't have the right to say to God, you must save me. God does it out of mercy. God does it out of love. God does it because he cares for you and for me. And even though I make mistakes, the Lord says, I love you, and I will be merciful, and I will help you to correct that mistake. I'll lift you out of the miry clay. It was a great price, wasn't there? I mean, Jesus had to give his own life because of the messes that people had made, even though God gave a different way. And even today, and even if I look at my own life, I can think of many, many times that God has given warnings. The Bible is full of warnings. Right? This is the way, walking in it. That's really a warning. That's an instruction. That's saying, if I go a different way, I'm in danger. Okay. And if I choose that path, I have to be prepared to accept the responsibility for that choice. Ephesians, let's go there. Ephesians chapter 2. Verses 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved. See, God is rich in mercy. 
Now, the other piece of all of this, that as God's children, we have to understand, and we have to not lose sight of, is a good example given to us in Luke chapter 12. You see, some people would think, oh, okay, so the Bible gives me a get-out-of-jail-free card. That no matter how poorly I act, no matter what terrible mistakes I make, God is always going to be there to rescue me because He loves me, and He is merciful, and He has grace, so I can do anything I want, and God is always going to be there to help me. Well, that's not to say that there won't be a price to pay. Okay. Back to the hurricane example. The people, I think, again, most, not all, but many that chose to stay, even though they were warned to leave, suffered a great ordeal that night that they were in their homes. If their home remained standing, that was a real blessing. If it didn't have water damage, that would be even a greater blessing. If they were never in threat of being killed or dying, that would be a wonderful blessing. But many spent a sleepless night. Some I heard said, we even started praying, as if that was a phenomenal thing that they were doing. I thought, yes, you should have been praying. You know, you were silly to stay there in the first place. Again, that's just my opinion. Uh, but, you know, and then they were making a big deal. The reporter said, what? You even started praying? And this gentleman said, yes, we even started praying because we, were, we thought our house was going to come down and that we would all die. You see, they made a bad choice there was a consequence. Even if afterwards somebody did come to rescue them. Okay. Far better, I think, to have been in a safe place, dry place, a place that there was no danger of dying, and to do that long before the storm came. But I want you to see that even though they were rescued, they did suffer a consequence. Okay? And that's very scriptural, actually. Because in Luke chapter 12, let me read just two verses here. Luke 12, verse 47 and 48. I'm pulling this out of the midst of a longer uh, parable, but it says, verse 47, And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Now, let's just stop there for a second. So it's the servant, there's somebody there, and it says to us, knew his Lord's will. No questions, right? They knew exactly what the Lord wanted them to do. But Scripture says to me, because they didn't do it, it says neither did according to his will, and it says didn't prepare himself. So in other words, ignored, basically ignored what the master told the servant to do. Okay. What's the consequence? Shall be beaten with many stripes. I think most of us would say, well, that's fair. You know, that, that's righteous. That's God being a fair judge. If you don't do what the Master tells you to do, there's going to be a consequence, and it's a negative one. But read a little bit further. Okay? But he that knew not, so now there's somebody who didn't hear, okay, and did commit things worthy of stripes, so in other words, still did things wrong, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. But let's focus just on that 
first part of that longer verse, verse 48. So here we have now somebody who didn't know, didn't hear, okay? He doesn't say that they're going to get out scot-free. There will be fewer strikes, but there's still going to be some strikes. And you see, the world today wants to get away with doing the wrong thing, and they don't want any strikes whatsoever. They don't want any negative consequences whatsoever. They just want the mercy part. They just want somebody to bail them out. But that's not the way it works. That's not the way it works in Scripture. And that's not the way it works in reality. And as God's people, we also have to accept the entire Bible. <coughs> when you make a mistake, like I make some, I have to confess and bear responsibility for my error. <coughs> I recognize, and this is the Christian way, we have to recognize there will be a price to pay. But, because we are God's children, God loves us so, God has mercy on each and every one of us, He shows His grace, and He rescues us. But there's still a price that has to be paid, regardless. Those that made those poor choices down there in Louisiana, I think they made a poor choice. They still deserved to be rescued. But they also deserve the price that they had to pay. So, you know, if I would have been stubborn and I'd say, I'm staying, and I'm not boarding up my windows, no way, it's not going to be that bad. And I'm not putting sandbags around my home, forget it, it's not going to be that bad. And I'm not getting extra gasoline or extra propane or anything like that, because it's not going to be that bad. Well, it turned out for many, it was that bad and much worse. So if all my windows blow in, and my house floods, and now I don't have any hydro, or I don't have any fuel to run my generator, that's my own fault. And that's a consequence that I have to bear. But I'll also be very thankful if somebody eventually comes to rescue me. And that last part, that's God's mercy. I don't deserve the rescuing. Do you understand that? There's nobody here that deserves God's mercy, His grace, and the way He rescues us. Nobody here deserves that. We're not worthy. We deserve the punishment. Full force. But God, in His mercy and love, comes to bail us out. So, in truth, I believe, scripturally, it's okay to rescue those people. Because we need to show our love to them. They will pay a price. They've got some major things they have to do. And they should be involved in that repair work and all those things that perhaps wouldn't have been so bad if they, you know, had done what they were supposed to do. But my point is that when I first looked at them and said, in a sense, it's your own fault, too bad, so sad, if you don't have power, you don't have food, you don't have water, hey, you made a bad choice, too bad for you. That's not the attitude that should be my testimony. My testimony needs to be, okay, you made a bad choice. Are you sorry about your choice? Are you willing to work to make reparation for the choices that you have made? Can you make your wrongs right somehow? 
We'll save you. We'll pull you up. We'll help you. Because that's what God did for me. That's what he did for me. And sometimes if you're like me, you might look at yourself and you might think, why did God do this for me? Right? In Scripture, we have those comparisons to being like worms. I'm like a worm. And yet God sent His Son. He gave up the life of His Son to rescue me when I don't deserve it whatsoever. So we have this privilege, you see. And in closing, let me go to Hebrews. Just one verse here. There is something that you and I, we have to do. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Last verse in Hebrews chapter 4. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, that speaks about the grace that's there for us. But notice what it says at the beginning. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. I've had a couple of messages lately about choices, right? And tonight's really about choice as well. When the Lord says, I'm here to save you, you have to accept it. I have to accept it. We have to be willing to come to the altar, to come to the Lord and say, I messed up. Or I'm a mess. Or this part of my life needs big time help. You see, there is still a responsibility that every one of us bears. <coughs> because let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace tells me that you have to come to the throne of grace I have to come to the throne of grace and that you can't go there for me and I can't go there for you. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. To bear my burden. To bring it to the cross. To ask the Lord to help me to carry it or to take it away from me there at the cross. When the rescue ships come around to those people that are flooded out and stranded, those people have to be willing to be rescued. And I'm sure there's still going to be some that say no. Up to them. And it's the same thing. You see, the Lord knocks on your door. The Lord calls constantly. Come unto me, he says. All ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But you have to come. That's your responsibility. That's my responsibility. To come to the Lord just as we are. No pretending. And no blaming it on somebody else. Which sometimes, I think we get good at doing. Oh, so-and-so didn't give me the right information. Oh, this, oh, that. Today, I have to say, you know, ultimately, this mistake was my fault. It was ultimately my responsibility. And I have to say that to this individual. And it's bothered me all day. That's the kind of person I am. I feel badly about it all day. Nothing really I can do at this point, but ask for forgiveness from him and from the Lord for something that I forgot to do. But it's my responsibility. So, no telling lies. No passing the buck. No saying, it was so and so, it was so and so, it was so and so. Be honest before the Lord. And let's be honest before the mission field as well. It's not a bad thing for the world to see that we are only saved through grace, by God's power, by His love, by His mercy. There's no way we're perfect. No way. And if 
we can show the world, the unsaved, that we're willing to take responsibility when we make mistakes, but we know we have a Savior that we can come to and go to. You know, I prayed today, Lord, forgive me. It's not a life or death kind of a thing. And some people would maybe just slough it right off. Okay, so you forgot to send something. No big deal. Okay, we can fix it. But it didn't make me feel very good. Okay? So let's show the world we're honest, we're truthful, we're responsible, and we know a Savior who shows mercy and is willing to help us out, even though at times we do some very, very, not very smart things. Amen? Mm -hmm. One way for us to be a testimony to the world. Let's all stand there. pray. Lord Father, I thank you for your goodness this evening. And I thank you, dear Lord Jesus, for every missionary, whether they are stationed, find themselves in a country far from ours, or whether they are working in Canada, or whether they're working in your house, or on your street, or in the workplace, wherever they might happen to be, God bless every one of your children. <laughs> that is an example and shares the word and lives the life, not pretending to be perfect, not pretending to be something that we are not, but being honest and letting the world see and know that we're blessed because we have a Savior who loves us. We're blessed because we have a Savior that when we come to Him truthfully, no lies. But when we tell the Lord truthfully, this is where we're at. And this is what we need. God, in truth, is always there to say, and I can give that to you. I can make that so. Give your heart to me, and I will carry that heavy burden. I'll lift the heavy load, and you can even just leave it here at the cross, and I'll take care. That's how great a Savior, that's the God that we say we serve. And Lord, I just pray, help my life to be a testimony of that. I know it's not going to be perfect by a long shot. But Lord, if I can be honest about my shortcomings, then I believe, dear Lord Jesus, that is a good testimony. And that will help others to come just as they are to meet the Savior, just like I did so many years ago. Lord, I still need you every day. Every day. Yes. And I thank you, Father, for your patience. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for forgiveness and for love that you share and for strength that you give us even though we don't deserve it for blessings and protection you give us, even though we really don't deserve it. Father, you are the best example that anyone could ever be. And so help me to keep my eyes upon you, looking to you for help, like I needed it today, and like I'm sure I'm going to need it again. But Lord, you're there, loving me, your arms around me, around every one of us. Thank you, Lord, and may you strengthen our missionaries tonight. Let them feel those loving arms around them as well. That as they impart to others, I have a feeling they make mistakes. But Lord, you be with them. Strengthen them and help them to find favor in the eyes of the world and those around them so that your name would be glorified, high and lifted up. Be with us this evening as we go to our homes, which are such a blessing, Lord, that we have the power, we have the water running, we have shelter. Lord God, I thank you for food so much, God, that you have given, and we are so unworthy. But Lord, we thank you for it. And so be with us as we travel to our homes, and bring us back again, I ask, in Jesus' name, amen.